I invite you to remain standing as we hear today's gospel lesson, as we hear Jesus' words contained in John's gospel, the 14th chapter. Do not be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Many of you know that Richard and I enjoy watching movies, and I was reminded recently that at the 86th Annual Academy Awards, which took place way back in 2014, the movie 20 Feet from Stardom won the Oscar for the best documentary feature film. Now, I don't know how many of you watch documentary films, but we can learn a lot from watching these documentaries and what they have to teach us about ourselves as God's people in God's world and in relationship with one another. But what brought that movie back to my mind is the fact that it is a movie that honors the unknown musicians who serve as backup singers. They served as backup vocalists for people like Elvis Presley, Tom Jones, Frank Sinatra, Aretha Franklin, Bruce Springsteen, and the Rolling Stones. Some of you might have seen this movie. Well, many of those, blacks, many of those singers were black women who grew up with fathers who were pastors. And that was the case for one dear backup singer by the name of Darlene Love. Darlene Love was prominent in that documentary. She's now 81 years old, but she was there at the Academy Awards that night and she took part in accepting that award on behalf of all the backup singers. And this is what she said to all of that Hollywood Glitterati who were gathered there in their finery. She started her speech this way. Lord God, I praise you. And I am so happy to be here representing the ladies of 20 feet from stardom. And then she broke out into song singing in, with an enthusiastic voice a rendition of one of the most famous gospel hymns ever. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Wow. I thought, now that's just right in your face for somebody from Hollywood to stand up there and start out by praising God and then by singing before everyone a gospel hymn. And I wondered how everybody would react to this, but she received resounding applause. Resounding applause. And I had to think to myself, I wonder... If the people who are applauding are applauding because of her enthusiasm or because they understand that that song is repeating the same words that Jesus said to the gathered multitude in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus told us to not worry about anything for God cares for the sparrows, and he cares for us. You know, that song was first made popular by Ethel Waters, who sang it in the Billy Graham Crusades many years ago. And she used it as the title of her first autobiography. And in that autobiography, Ethel Waters said that she grew up knowing fear and pain she knew what it was like to be deeply and hopelessly sad in life. You see, her birth resulted from the rape of her teenage mother. She grew up without a father. She grew up in poverty. 
And in her autobiography, she writes that she never lived in one place for more than 15 months at a time. She said she married when she was 13 years old. And then she left that abusive man. And she worked as a maid in Philadelphia, earning 75 cents a week. But despite all of that, she continued to testify of God's provincial care in her life. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. My friends, that kind of faith is born of knowing that deep love of Jesus that Susan talked to our children about. Being so filled with the love of Jesus in her life that despite all of the difficulties, she was able to sing and see God's care in her life. And that is exactly the theme of every one of the five days of Vacation Bible School that we held here two weeks ago for over 30 children and the adults who worked with them, sharing with us that we can shine Jesus' light no matter what is going on in our life, when we are happy and when we are sad. And my friends, that's a message that's throughout the entire Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament. You know, sometimes people have this impression that the God that is revealed in the Old Testament is a vengeful, vindictive God, judgmental God. But the God of the New Testament is the God of Jesus, the God of love, and the God of grace. But we read in the New Testament that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we need to be reacquainted with some of those stories in the Old Testament that remind us of God's love and God's grace that is always there. You know, the very first words in the book of Genesis as the Bible begins, that very first book in the Old Testament, the very first thing that God brought into being was light. Light. Light into the darkness the difficult times, the troubles, the sadness, light is what God has always brought into the world. So I want to remind you today of a story from the Old Testament, a story that is contained in Genesis 16 through 21. And I'm just going to remind you of it and then encourage you to read it on your own sometime later this week. See, the background of the story is this. It's a story that begins with the father of faith, Abraham, and his wife, Sarah. They had followed God's orders to leave their homeland, which is now Iraq, and move to a place that is now Israel. And God had promised to Abraham and Sarah, if you remember, that they would give birth to a child and that their descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky. God would bless them in this special way. But Sarah was very old and laughed at that news, not believing it. And so Sarah came up with a plan to fulfill this prophecy of God. She told her husband Abraham to take Hagar, her servant, and to have a child with Hagar. And so Abraham obeyed his wife, as all good husbands should do, right? And he had a child with Hagar. But at some point, Hagar must have taken on some kind of heirs because women's worth was judged by whether or not they could give birth to a child, and Sarah had been barren never able to give a child, but Hagar giving birth to a child probably was like, huh, I'm better than you. <laughs> I gave him the child you couldn't give him. And understandably, Sarah becomes jealous. But Sarah acts on that jealousy with vengeance, and she wants to banish Hagar. And yet... God hears Hagar's despair. 
And God comes to Hagar and promises Hagar that even though Abraham and Sarah are putting her out, God will bless Hagar's son. And she is to name her son a special name, Ishmael. And Ishmael in the Hebrew means God hears. And God says to Hagar, Name your child Ishmael because I have heard your misery of not being totally accepted by Sarah and Abraham for who you are. My friends, this story of Hagar and Ishmael reminds us all that God is not deaf, dumb, or blind to whatever it is that we're going through. Our God is infinite, but our God is also intimate and understands our feelings and cares about our feelings. Now fast forward in this story a little bit as the text goes on. Sarah finally does have that child, that child Isaac. She gives to Abraham the son that God had promised she would give to Abraham. And so Sarah decides, well, it's time for Hagar and Ishmael to leave because I don't want Ishmael to get what is Isaac's rights. Isaac is the son who should be heir of everything. And so again, Abraham listens to Sarah and he sends Hagar and Ishmael out into the desert. Now get this, he sends them out into the desert with a skin full of water and a loaf of bread. Think about going out into the desert with nothing but a skin full of water and a loaf of bread. Now, Abraham is a wealthy man, and it seems to me that the least he could have done was to send her out into that hot desert with several weeks' worth of provisions until she could make her way to a village or someplace where someone else would take her in. But he doesn't do that. He sends her out with these meager provisions, knowing that there's no way for them to survive in the desert with that little bit. And so they find themselves both, Ishmael and Hagar, not just sad and crying, but helpless and hopeless, filled with despair. Then we hear this wonderful statement in verse 17 of chapter 21 of Genesis. God heard the boy crying. Just as God had heard Hagar's voice so many years earlier when she cried out. God hears the boy crying. Now my friends, this story, all the way through, every time they cry out, reminds me that God hears my cries and your cries too. And so in the time we have remaining, I want to help us reflect on the ways that God heard their cries and responded to their needs. Because God just doesn't hear the cries and say, oh, how sad for you. But God responds to meet those needs of our tears. First, God reaches out to us through other people. In verse 18, God hears the cry of the boy Ishmael, and he goes to Hagar, the boy's mother, and he says to Hagar, go and pick up your son. Take him by the hand and comfort him. You see, Hagar had left her boy off to the side, and she had walked away feeling in her heart that there was no way that either one of them would survive. And as a mother's heart broke for her child, she could not watch her son die. So she left him alone and walked away. And God comes to her and says, don't do that. Go to your child and comfort your child. Your child. 
God calls each and every one of us to go to those who are crying and hurting. No matter how much it hurts us inside to see their pain, God calls us to step into their pain and be present, to be the hands and feet and heart of God, giving comfort and peace and assuring them that they are not alone. It reminds me of that ancient story that was told as a true eyewitness account that took place in New York City many, many years ago. You've probably heard this story before, but it's so real to me. It's a story of a little boy who is standing outside one of those department store windows, and he's staring inside. It happens to be a shoe store. He's standing there and he's shivering in the New York cold air, just staring in the window. An older lady walks by and she notices the boy staring in the window. And she says, young man, what are you doing? And he said, I'm standing here praying that God will help me get some shoes. She looked down at the tattered shoes that he was wearing with no socks. And she said, oh, son, come with me. She grabbed his little hand and she walked into the store and she asked the clerk, can you bring me out a dozen pairs of socks that'll fit his little feet? And bring me out a basin of water if you have one back there and a towel. And the shop owner did, he brought out the bundle of socks and he brought out the basin of water. And the lady took the little boy to the back of the store and sat him down on a little stool and she bent down herself and she washed his little feet, dried him gently with that towel and then she took a pair of those socks and put on his little feet. She looked up at the store clerk and she said, find me a pair of shoes that fit his little feet. And then she put those little shoes on him and she paid the clerk. She tied up the other little socks together. She handed them to the little boy and she said, I think you're going to be a lot more comfortable now when you go back outside. And the little boy looked up at her had a big grin on his face and he said lady can I ask you a question she said sure and then a tear started falling down his face and he said are you God's wife <laughs> my friends I love that story because that story is more true than that little boy knew. You see, we as the church are called the bride of Christ. Did you know that? We are the bride of Christ. And we are called to go where there are needs in this world, where people are crying and share the light and the love, the compassion, the grace, the peace to meet the needs of others. Jesus said, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. When I was sick, you came. We are called to go where there is pain in this world. And the second thing that I learned from this story of Ishmael is that not only does God hear our cry and respond to our need through other people, but God also responds to our need by opening our eyes to see the hope that is present in our midst. You see, if you look back at this story, in chapter 21, verse 19, we read that God opened Hagar's eyes and she was able to see, as she went over to comfort her boy, she was able to see in the distance a well that she could fill that flask with water again. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us why she never saw that well of water before now. Presumably, that well had always been there. 
But my feeling is that probably neither she nor Ishmael saw that well of water because often when we are sad and discouraged and worried and fret fretting over things, we have a tendency to navel gaze. Y'all know what navel gazing is, don't you? Looking into ourselves, just looking down, oh, poor pity me, nothing's going to help. My situation is so difficult. And our world gets very, very small. And we don't notice the goodness around us. You've probably been around people like that, and maybe you found yourself in situations like that at times, that all you can see is discouraging, is negative, is overwhelming. But my friends, there is always beauty and there is always grace and God always makes a way. There was a wonderful psychiatrist, Carl Menninger. Many of y'all have heard his name over the years. And he was once asked what he would say to a person who was on the verge of a nervous breakdown and Menninger replied, I would tell them to go out and find somebody immediately who needed their help. Because the best way for us to get out of that feeling of despair and hopelessness is for us to turn our eyes outward and help someone else who is in need. For us to open our eyes to the gifts of time and talent and treasure we have that we can use to help others. And if your experience is like mine, we receive so much more joy and grace and peace when we help others than the joy and grace and peace that we give out. In helping others, we help ourselves. So my friends, the lesson of Ishmael and Hagar reminds me that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That God hears our cries. God cares about what we're going through. And God responds to those needs. May we have the faith and the courage to so believe. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.